Hello, I'm Tom Polasik, a professor of urology at the Duke Cancer Institute and director of focal therapy and ablative technologies. I'd like to discuss prostate cryoablation tips and tricks. And this is important because we want to achieve success when performing cryoablation and avoid preventable complications. There are three particular areas that one can injure, the sphincter resulting in incontinence, the rectum resulting in fistula, and the urethra resulting in prosthetic slough. And more importantly, we tend to see incomplete ablation at times, which is due to insufficient ice ball coverage resulting in PSA recurrence. But these are all technical issues under your control. First, one has to understand the technology. This is a schematic of the ice ball. The edge of the ice ball is zero degrees centigrade and is not lethal. One has to go about three to four millimeters within the ice edge to get in the minus 20 isotherm. Now, most of the cells treated in minus 20 may undergo apoptosis, they may survive or die. Once you get into the core of the ice ball, which is about minus 40, those cancers for sure are dead. The first topic is incomplete ice ball coverage. This is due to incorrect probe placement or perhaps the wrong probe choice. In this schematic here, one can see three ice balls formed. Again, the white color is the lethal ice. The transparent color is the sublethal ice where cells may live or die. But you can see here warm pockets of incomplete treatment due to incomplete probe placement. So if we reposition those probes and make sure this ice overlap, one has a better chest chance of achieving success. This is a schematic showing ice balls in sagittal dimension here. Again, this is just a, a picture cartoon, but one can see here that there's incomplete coverage between these ice balls in sagittal view resulting in treatment failure. The solution here is to verify probe placement. What one can do is to make sure in sagittal view that these uh, probes and the ice balls in fact overlap. Now one way to, to verify before freezing is to look down on the insulators. Here you have one brachytherapy grid and here's the insulators and you can see that they're essentially all lined up. Typically, one puts ice balls through a brachy grid and they all grow in through a horizontal um, configuration. But on occasion, one may get one that is a little bit skewed. Typically, in the near field here, uh, one can still achieve success. But as you go further out, you're going to have warm pockets in this area. It's important to verify this under transaxial and also sagittal view. The urethra, as one knows, can be an S-shape, as you can see in the sagittal dimension here. So in general, we try to avoid placing probes such as above or below the urethra due to the S-shaped curve of the urethra, because if you injure the urethra, it can result in a prosthetic slough. So typically, the probes are placed on either side of the urethra, but not above or below. This is a photo of a urethral perforation. You can see here the cryoprobe perforating the urethra. You can see the stripe band on the cryoprobe. If this happens, it's not a problem. Simply pull it out and reposition it. But for sure, you don't want to freeze with this like this because you will kill the urethra and that will result in a slough. The circulating pump is important because it prevents urethral slough by keeping the urethra warm. Typically, it's set between 40 to 42 degrees centigrade. One has to look at it occasionally, both in terms of the temperature and making sure that the watermark that one sees right here is maintained. Now, typically, we don't have problems with the circulating pump uh, because it's placed after the probes are placed. But on occasion, if you reposition a probe when the balloon is intact, you may perforate the warming balloon. How does one avoid thermal injury to the rectum? First, make sure that the probes are accurately placed, and then one has to develop the non-VAs 
usually by one of two techniques, either dropping the rectum further posteriorly or injecting saline as a protective buffer. And then finally, we have our temperature thermocouples, which allow for temperature monitoring during the, the freezing process, along with ultrasound monitoring. Now, there's a difference between primary and radiation failures. Of course, for men who've had radiation, they have less blood uh, supply to the rectum. And thus, for me, I tend to be less aggressive in terms of the freeze around the rectum. I think a good idea is to place all these posterior probes, and you may have two or four, however many it is, uh, based on the, the width of the prostate, all in a horizontal row. And in this schematic, you see that one of the probes is a little further posteriorly placed, and one has to be careful because uh, this one's gonna cross the finish line first if all these are run on the same channel. Now you have the option of using different channels, but I think the easier way to do this is to place them all in a horizontal row, and therefore they'll all hit the, the rectal wall at the same time, and it's much easier to monitor. One has to create an end zone by dropping the rectum. This is a typical schematic of the posterior row. And you can see here that there's really no space here between the posterior capsule of the prostate and the anterior rectal wall. So what we need to do is to widen that space. And you have a couple different ways to do it. The way that I prefer is to drop the pressure on the rectal probe, and then that will allow this area here in the Navier's to widen. Alternatively, you can inject saline uh, into that area to achieve the same goal. Uh, this is a schematic of what it looks like on uh, sagittal, and we typically monitor these procedures under sagittal. You can see that the sublethal ice is hitting the anterior rectal wall, and of course, we want to widen that by either dropping the rectal wall further posteriorly or injecting saline. One has to be wary of the sphincter and the apex. I haven't seen any sphincter-related injuries. I think they're very rare, um, but at the same time, one of the most common areas of recurrence or incomplete ablation is at the apex. I think sometimes physicians may be a little bit timid about freezing the apex hard, but one wants to avoid incomplete ablation at the apex. Again, you have probe choice. You have to make sure your probes are placed correct when you have thermocouples to monitor the sphincter temperature. Here's a schematic of the apex. You can see here that the way the posterior one's placed on sagittal, it's not going to treat the apex very well. So you want to pull that a bit forward. Now, as you see in the cartoon here, um, there is some sublethal ice hitting the anterior rectal wall. I'm okay with this. Um, I'm okay with it hitting a little bit of the sphincter especially in the primary setting where that those tissues have not been radiated. But in the radiation setting, I'm a little bit more cautious about getting colder ice into either the sphincter or the anterior rectal wall. This is usually the last part of the prostate to freeze. You can see here the ice ball, the, the blackout effect of the ice ball as the sound cannot transmit through the ice, and you typically have a little bit of a notch at the apex. We're looking at the transaxial view at the apex here. And as you freeze further, this starts to flatten. And then finally, it's very flat, and here's the rectal wall, and then you're finished. This is what the completed freeze looks like on a sagittal point of view. You can see the hyperechoic ice ball rim, and we're right down on the rectal wall. There's enough sponginess to the rectum that you're not going to cause any injury with this. The median lobe is an interesting situation. Some men have them, some men don't. What I typically do is notice this on biopsy, and I will resect the median lobe before uh, prostate cryoablation. I may wait several months for that to heal. I do not resect the bladder neck, but essentially we don't treat the median lobe with cryoablation because First, it's benign, and second, um, it's close to the renal orifices. So it could be one of the reasons for PSA persistence. I'd rather not have PSA persistence. So with a large median lobe, I will typically resect it as a separate procedure before bringing the patient back for
cryoablation. So what are the situations where one can have detectable PSA? Um, first, uh, incorrect probe placement. Again, you have to understand the technology. You may need to reposition the probes. As we talked about, incomplete treatment of the apex is a very common uh, clinical scenario because typically physicians are a little bit hesitant to freeze the apex because you have the rectum and the sphincter in that area. But I think if you understand the technology and what you can achieve and you can see it under ultrasound and temperature monitoring, then you're fine. Incomplete posterior treatment, as we talked about, one wants to widen the navier so you can try to drive that cold isotherm down into the navier's fascia. There are some periurethral remnants. There's not much you can do about this because the urethra is going to, the warming catheter is going to keep the urethra warm and protect it. And fortunately, most cancers don't grow around the urethra, but it is one of the limitations of having a warming catheter. And the median lobe, we talked about identifying it and resecting just the lobe and not the bladder neck. What are some other complications? Uh, penile scrotal edema, we typically don't see this in the primary setting, but we do see this after a typically uh, external beam where the lymphatic drainage may be changed. You just want to elevate that and let the patient know that it's normal and expected and it spontaneously resolves. Perineal hematoma, you can avoid that with good firm perineal pressure for about five minutes after the probes are removed. Retention, uh, this happens. Um, prostate cryoablation does cause prostatic edema. Some men may go into retention. I uh, typically keep men on alpha blockers for uh, a month, and um, I leave the catheter for a week. Um, almost all these cases resolve spontaneously. Slough, again, is from having the ice ball too close to the protective catheter. Uh, keep your probes away from the urethra, as, as mentioned. If you do get a slough, I would really recommend not doing a TERP. Uh, I would place a suprapubic tube and sit on this for about six months, let everything scar in. Uh, typically, these things will heal. I feel that a TERP is probably not a good idea because it sets you up for other issues that, um, that are not really repairable, as remember that the ablated tissue is dead and you may end up with a pocket that does not heal very well. Fistula, again, I think it's under your control where you place your, your probes. If it does happen, uh, the patient may need repair. Now, keep in mind that if fistula does occur in the primary setting, uh, there's usually good blood supply to the rectum and the tissues around there. So if you sit on this with a catheter for several weeks, small fistulas can close spontaneously. But in the setting of radiation failure patients, where there is decreased blood supply, that may need a formal repair. And incontinence is very rare after cryoablation, perhaps in the order of 3% in the primary setting and up to 7% in the salvage setting. You want to avoid freezing the sphincter uh, and monitoring with your temperature uh, thermocouples. I hope this information was helpful. Thank you for your attention.